iGlobe News brings global views. iGlobe News is pleased to welcome our listeners to another edition of iGlobe News Pods. The topic of today's podcast is the history, present, and future of the Vienna School of International Studies. Here to discuss this topic is Ambassador Emil Bricks, Director of the Vienna School of International Studies, often referred to as the Vienna Diplomatic Academy, or DA. Ambassador Bricks is a graduate of the DA, as am I. Before becoming the director of the DA, Ambassador Bricks was the Austrian ambassador in London and Moscow. He is an historian and a diplomat, and he has been the director of the DA since 2017. In preparation for this interview, I read a book by the historian Heinrich Fusterschmidt Hardenstein with the name A Short History of the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna. Ambassador Bricks, welcome to our show. Thank you for the invitation to iGlobe News. Thank you. I'll start with three short questions, and then we'll go into a little bit the history um, of the Diplomatic Academy. How many countries, on average, are represented in the DA student body? Well, normally we have at least 50 countries represented in our student bodies, uh, and they come from all continents. Uh, and there is um, only a minority of Austrians. About one third of our students are Austrians. The rest comes from everywhere. So it's a very, very international environment. Yes, international and also with different academic backgrounds, which makes it even more interesting for the students, but also for us, faculty and director. I can definitely attest to that. How large is the student body at present? Uh, overall, we have in our student body up to 200 students. 200 students uh, is, is the, the optimum for the time being at our place because it gives us the chance for individual teaching, individual tutoring, individual supervision. Uh, so it's altogether 200, uh, most of them here on campus, but we also work with uh, Vienna University and Technical University. How many alumni does the DA have? We have a, about um, it depends now on what you call an al alumnus, uh, because the academy started in 1754. We don't count the first ones. Uh, we, we only count living uh, alumnus. Yes, that's... Uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> that makes it about less than 4,000, uh, and uh, about 50% of them are in our alumni association. Excellent. Club DA. Yes. I'm also a member of Club DA. Very good. Next... Next year marks the 270th anniversary of the founding of the Vienna School of International Studies on the 1st of January, 1754. Empress Maria Theresia founded the Oriental Academy, the forerunner of the DA, which today is the oldest diplomatic academy in the world. The goals of the Oriental Academy, as set out in 1953 by Chancellor Prince Kaunitz, were, and I paraphrase from the book, quote, gathered talented youths in the languages of the Orient and the Occident, as well as in all the branches of knowledge that are important for them to protect and promote the commercial and political interests of Austria in the Orient. The idea was to have the students live together, forming a community where they can be trained to become men who combine profound learning, business acumen, and fine manners with a strong sense of morality and religion, end of quote. Are these goals still valid today? And how have these goals changed during the past 270 years of existence of the DA? Uh, that's a huge question. Uh, on the one hand, the objectives and priorities have not changed. Uh, because we started with putting an emphasis on languages. At the beginning, it was mainly Oriental languages uh, like uh, uh, Turkish, but also Persian because the academy was founded to understand the relations with the Orient, with our neighbors and opponents uh, from the Ottoman Empire mainly. Uh, and secondly, as you mentioned in your quote already, it's always about multidisciplinarity. So a student from the beginning had to be aware that he's not studying mathematics alone or physics alone or uh, political science alone. He always had to, to, to think in a multidisciplinary uh, way, uh, and this did not change. Uh, what certainly changed is that we now have a global outreach. Uh, so the topic and priorities of the Diplomatic Academy, as we have it today, uh, is not only concentrating uh, on our Eastern neighbors, but we are trying to be 
something like uh, a diplomatic capital of education uh, on a global scale, if possible, for such a small institution. But we see it as our not only as our reputation to be the first, but the obligation uh, now to adapt to the things that are coming. So it's it's obvious uh, we live in a in a time where there is less trust. We live in a time which has no stable world order, uh, let alone a fair world order. Uh, so for us, it is very important uh, to make students understand what does it mean to, to work towards a fairer world order? What does it mean that we are in an unstable situation? Are we looking for stability again? What is the role of the big powers? Uh, and, and so this is a different time uh, from, the, uh, from the start of the academy. But I think one of the the, the, the ways we can do this is because we can attract not only students, but faculty from everywhere. Uh, so we are very flexible as a small institution to adapt to these challenges. From how many countries do your faculty come now as a, as a further question? Well, that cha changes all the time. So uh, uh, the, the, even our small resident faculty has a non-Austrian majority. Uh, and the resident faculty uh, is at the moment uh, only European, but our visiting faculty comes from the US, from Israel, um, uh, from, from, uh, from all sorts of places. Uh, and uh, we try also to bring in uh, all these practical experts. So we, we are working with a lot of, of diplomats, uh, ambassadors who are uh, bilateral or multilateral ambassadors in Vienna, but not only. We bring in people from Brussels for the European uh, Union I issues. Uh, we lately brought in uh, people from Latin America talking about these regional cooperation structures that, that are developing there. Uh, we certainly concentrate on, on, on China, Japan, on Taiwan issues, uh, on, on India. Uh, so it's for us, it's always necessary actually to bring in people from the region also uh, to give a, a first-hand experience on, on what's happening uh, but we have this academic standard so they're not here just to uh, to give us their policy views of their countries but they're here actually uh, to work with our students in an academic way i can definitely attest to that the Oriental Academy had a novel approach. It did not require the students to be of noble birth. The first group of accepted students in 1954 consisted of eight individuals, five of whom did not belong to the nobility. This was a very revolutionary idea at the time. Talent and the will to learn and immerse oneself in the study of language and culture, as you just mentioned, were a central theme. These eight pupils lived together in the so-called residence. Has the present-day DA realized these revolutionary ideas? Well, we have realized uh, how revolutionary it was at its time, but I have to say we also realized that at that time it was it, it were only male students who, who were allowed to. So, as you said, not only aristocratic, uh, majority not aristocratic, but only males. Uh, so it, it is good that times have changed now. We have a majority of, of female students uh, regularly at, at, at our academy, uh, this is a this is also a major change. Uh, and the, the second major change is that at the time uh, the academy was done for having in Austria more experience and more knowledge about global affairs. Uh, today we are saying uh, yes. We also work with Austrian foreign policy uh, um, makers and shapers. But we are here actually to educate people for global leadership. So it's not only for, for, for the Austrian scene, it's done with a lot of, of, of non-Austrians uh, to work on the global scene. And that's a, a, also a major change, uh, which happened already in the 19th century. So the 19th century was also important for us. Women were allowed uh, also in, at the academy, uh, and we started to have non-Austrians uh, among our students. Uh, and the faculty is, has become so international now. So the DA has been a trailblazer in many areas, one could say. Uh, I would love to say that that's true. Uh, uh, and uh, actually, until nowadays, whenever there is somewhere on the globe, uh, a new diplomatic academy founded by a lot of countries, I'm not naming and shaming now, but many of them uh, immediately also reach out to us uh, for some getting some of our experience involved in their development of the place, 
the, but also the curriculum, uh, the way they should deal with it. Uh, and we try to be to, to help out, uh, mainly with saying if you want to be successful as a school of international studies, don't only talk about diplomacy, talk about international relations, uh, talk about uh, that there is no career path without, without an international experience and international knowledge nowadays. So what do you look for in applications today? Have the qualifications needed to become a diplomat evolved compared to those in 1754? No, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the, the basic idea that uh, of a diplomat is always an is still that uh, you have to put yourself, your head, into the position uh, of uh, the people who ha you have to negotiate with, the people you try to understand. So this idea that diplomats are there uh, to, uh, to, to, to create some sort of knowledge uh, of the other, whoever the other is in a negotiation or, or in, a, uh, in, a, in a bilateral re relations, that has not changed. But the way you do it, the tools you, you use for that have dramatically changed, uh, 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 not only with uh, the invention of things like the telephone, television, uh, social media, uh, digital world. So the tools are changing. Uh, the idea that you, uh, if you want to have successful negotiation, successful good relations, depends on how much you understand uh, your vis-a-vis, -vis, how, how much you understand who your partners are uh, and how you can build trust and come up with, uh, with, I don't like the word compromise, but solutions where you have the interest of both sides somehow represented. That's in the nature of a negotiation. You always have to give and take and find a middle ground. But you mentioned something very important, namely cultural awareness, uh, which is one of the main foci of training at the DA. How does the DA implement this in concrete terms? Well, in concrete terms, is uh, we have, uh, uh, for the time being, uh, four different uh, areas of, of, of teaching and, and research. Uh, and one of them is history, global history. Uh, from the very beginning, history was taught at, at the DA. So that makes almost 270 years of history teaching. And in difference to many other schools of international studies, we did not stop having this chair of, of history. Uh, and we are very proud because it seems to be the case that uh, in our time, uh, the knowledge of history and how it relates, what, what, how politics of memory plays a role in international relations uh, is coming to the foreground again. We see it uh, with the argumentation of, of Mr. Putin in the, in the Russian war of aggression, but we see it actually uh, everywhere. You might call it identity politics is back. Uh, in a sort of, 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 of difficult way for international relations. Uh, and we are proud that we've, uh, we continue to have this, this sort of tradition of working with historical examples, but also trying to come up with something that is based on knowledge of history. So what is the role of diplomacy in the 21st century, especially in the age of the internet? What are the main careers and positions of today's graduates? Well, the, uh, the role of diplomacy is a very traditional one. Communicate, communicate between different interests and, and the people who represent these different interests. Uh, if only if you communicate. Again, there is a word I don't like too much, the word dialogue, because dialogue is a very broad uh, concept. Uh, I, I, I rather would like to bring it down to the technical side. We try to educate our students uh, how best to communicate in a given situation. And communication uh, includes something like uh, empathy with your partners uh, and all these sort of social qualities you have to develop. Uh, it includes certainly the knowledge aspect of, uh, of, of the, the person you have to understand or the, the interest you have to understand. And finally, it, it comes to using the right tools uh, for, for communication. And there we have vast developments, as we all know. Uh, and uh, if you ask me about what's, what's new at, the, at this situation at the moment is that there are many more disruptive elements by international relations than we used to have, for instance, in the time of the, of the Cold War. Uh, I don't think that uh, we don't teach our students to, uh, to relate everything uh, to uh, decolonization 
uh, or everything only to uh, to the, the fact that that uh, uh, we don't have a clear superpower dominance uh, in the world at the moment, but it's it's it's, multi, it's get it's becoming multipolar. But these are is, are the background issues uh, you have to be aware when you want to study international relations. Is this not also a result of the fact that the world is becoming very complex? And as you already mentioned, a multipolar world with a lot of actors uh, playing a major part in what's going on in the world today. Yes. Uh, one of the main things, uh, and it takes one or two years to, to, to really help our students with this, uh, is saying how do we react to these dis disruptions? How can we recognize where they happen, what the consequences are, and how we how we living in this more fragmented world uh, in a way which creates the trust again, which is necessary. If you don't have the trust, there is an option for many countries to, to use military force. Uh, and uh, uh, the recent example of yesterday, uh, the way that uh, Azerbaijan went again to war, Uh, again, the people in, in, in Agorni Karabakh is an example that where, where at the beginning it became clear that in this fragmentation, fragmented world, hard power, military power may count a lot. But this war, as we, as we hope, took only one day and now the diplomats are talking to each other again. So with this coming academic year, the DA has introduced a new course of study, the Master of Science in Digital International Affairs, also known as the DIA, organized in cooperation with the University of Innsbruck. According to the DA website, the curriculum covers academic programs to achieve qualifications to deal with big data, cybersecurity, digital diplomacy, international law and economics. Could you tell us more about why the DA started this new program on digital diplomacy and how does it complement the MICE program? Uh, it is obvious that we are living in a digital age. And it is obvious that we are not up to date with our institutions to respond to this fact. Uh, even go in governments, issues in general, countries are all now looking for digital ambassadors. They are looking for uh, how to, to include digital work in, in, the, in their uh, administration. Uh, so there is no area where digitalization doesn't play a role. Uh, and uh, diplomacy is normally a very conservative undertaking. It is very slow, and to, in, in many instances, it's, it's good that it's slow, that it's continuous, that it has its protocol, its rules. Uh, but uh, the digital world is disrupting this to a certain extent. Uh, and only if you have young people who understand this disruption, can work with the technical aspects of this, can see where there might be uh, challenges, uh, but also where there are chances in this digital world. That's the reason why we start this this. Uh, new master of digital international relations. Uh, actually, uh, we want to prepare it in, a, 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 in the best way. And that's the reason why we only start with the study year 24-25. Uh, so we start next summer with, with, with this course. So there is now still time to apply uh, for, the, for the first, uh, uh, for the first uh, uh, cohort of, uh, of students. Uh, and we are looking for a very international group of people. Uh, and, but it's challenging. Because the difference to the mice is that it's not only about how politics shapes the world in, in a disruption, but it's, it's about how the digital life disrupts in this disrupted international order. So the students uh, will get the chance uh, to have this sort of uh, advanced international studies program. But also, they have to, for one year, they have to get to the nitty gritty uh, of digital life, uh, how it will develop, how it did develop, uh, how you can work uh, with logarithms, uh, what artificial intelligence is bringing us, let's see, in the, in the coming years. Uh, and, but also, uh, uh, computer uh, learning, machine learning, Uh, uh, large language uh, components of, of this work. Everything that is technical and the consequences are, are part of this new master program. And uh, actually, uh, if uh, I would study again at, at the Vienna School of International Studies, I would for sure go for this digital international masters. So what role does artificial intelligence play in all of this? And does artificial intelligence have a role in digital diplomacy? 
I am not one of those who uh, believe in dystopian ideas. Uh, I rather go for the utopian side of things. Uh, and I think there are a lot of chances uh, in making more use of, of artificial intelligence. Um, but regulation is necessary. Uh, we can see it already now. Uh, uh, if people are not prepared how to work uh, with these elements of artificial intelligence, uh, it, it, will, it could get out of hand. It could get off, out of hand, and we know in the, in the military aspects of this artificial intelligence world that a lot of political leaders are very concerned that we still don't have these regulations. Uh, so part of, uh, of, of, of what we teach here, and, and right so, I think, uh, is that uh, how can we work on these global regulations? Uh, the, the European Union is, is, is doing an AI act, preparing it. It's very difficult. Uh, as we know, there are uh, also uh, at the UN level, there are discussions uh, what to do. Uh, and, and I'm sure we will have to come with global regulations on artificial intelligence. But in, in, in for the diplomatic world, this regulation side will be very important. And then there is the very practical side, simply how can a diplomat use artificial intelligence? Uh, and for sure, in, in, in a lot of routine uh, activities, uh, in the consular part of the diplomatic world, um, artificial intelligence is already used, uh, sometimes in a very simple way of, of, of working with, um, I don't know, migration documents to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to make the process faster of asylum, for asylum seekers and things like that. So there is a lot of, uh, of, of, of usage already. Uh, and, uh, but there could be more, uh, uh, think about reporting, diplomatic reporting. Uh, um, when I was a diplomat uh, uh, abroad in, 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 in UK and Russia, I always thought uh, the big uh, daily newspapers and, and magazines are better in reporting than I can ever be. Uh, because they, 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 they simply concentrate on analyzing these sort of things. Uh, so I, I, I thought what is necessary, what I can do as a diplomat, uh, is bringing in the experience that I make on the ground. And that's a bit different than the experience if you have a correspondent for, I don't know, for Frankfurt Argument or for Financial Times, uh, because the context that you have as a diplomat can be different. So you have um, sometimes a closer approach uh, to things. So that that's the part of reporting, uh, which is still uh, which is still necessary. But for all the routine things, for all the facts, uh, you can use uh, um, uh, machine learning in 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 a, in a very effective way. Uh, I would say, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's about what you make out of this of, of this reporting, and this I think will stay with the diplomats, speed in the capital cities or, or or in the relevant countries where they are where they are uh, acting. So you mentioned the word reporting, and then of course the big topic of fake news comes up. Is this also something that is dealt with in the new DIA program, and how does this factor into digital diplomacy? Yeah. Well, certainly, uh, we do a lot of work on propaganda, uh, which actually fake news is a new form, a new term for uh, for the old uh, uh, word pr propaganda. Uh, and we also do a lot on, 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 if you want to take it broader, on public diplomacy. And that's something that is, is also in the center of our work here, uh, how the relevance uh, and possibilities of public diplomacy have expanded. Give you the, uh, the, uh, the example of uh, the Vienna Treaties in the 60s about uh, diplomatic and consular matters, which are in since that time, uh, which are relevant for all uh, national actors. And they say diplomats are not allowed to interfere in internal affairs. Not allowed to interfere in internal affairs. But what is the public diplomacy if you are an ambassador in another country? You interfere in internal affairs with every lecture you give in university, with every meeting you have with a journalist, with every school uh, you visit there, with every position you uh, you you talk. So that this differentiation between domestic and international affairs is a very has become a very blurred. Uh, uh, a border uh, and public diplomacy uh, has become so important. But the consequence is uh, that if if uh, policymakers know about this importance, they want to use it uh, the way they they see it, it properly fit for them. Uh, so it makes for a lot of of actors 
very interesting to create fake news, to create propaganda, to, to, to have troll factories, as we know in some countries, uh, where uh, you, you, you directly uh, intervene with the public in a different country or in a different organization or whatever you call it. Uh, so we, we, we teach on these dangers also of, of, this, of this side of public diplomacy, but also telling the students uh, that uh, it, it is worth looking into how propaganda worked in the not only in the in the 20th century but mainly in the 20th century and what we can learn in the, from the reactions and how to deal with that uh, in the in the in the in the in the days of social media and artificial intelligence uh, it is much more difficult uh, as we know there is a lot of deep fakes you can um, produce all sorts of interviews like ours without actually talking to the person you interview. Uh, so uh, we need to, to find ways to respond to this and, and to find out. So it's, it's, it's a bit like uh, you would like to, it's, it's medical work on how we can uh, change social media uh, into a better tool also for positive effects of diplomacy. Which brings us back also to the concept of regulation, which we also mentioned before. So what do you look for, for the applicant for the new DIA program? Well, we expect that they are much sought after uh, in, in all the fields where, uh, where it's obvious that major decisions depend on uh, good information and good knowledge of how the digital world, uh, world works. Uh, there is the term innovation. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, this is one of the terms that Austrians invented in the early 20th century. Most of these terms, like uh, the management uh, of Peter Tracker or the the, uh, the the language philosophy of Ludwig Wittgenstein, that was an Austrian invention. And it's not because we are so clever, but because the Austrians uh, at that time had to deal with plurality and so many different cultural traditions in a multinational empire until 1918. So that, that, that's, that's uh, for us uh, a given that we can make use today also in trying to understand what innovation and disruption, not only in the business world, but also in the political world means uh, and how to respond to this. I always uh, tell our students, and I will also tell it to the students of the uh, of the uh, digital international relations, uh, there, there, is, there, there is no crystal ball that we can offer you. Uh, and uh, the only thing that we can do is uh, to find for, for you some sort of help, how we can, uh, on the one hand, keep up the idea that we want to have a fair liberal world order, but on the other hand, be as realistic as you can when you analyze the situation. Uh, and uh, and and then make your own decisions uh, and, and don't uh, don't uh, uh, fall into the trap that uh, if you create something like a safe surrounding, American universities have all these problems with safe surroundings and safe spaces. Uh, and I always uh, uh, tell our students at the beginning, uh, and I hope they, they understand what I mean, I say, we are not creating safe spaces here. We are creating on purpose unsafe spaces because you have to learn to live in the real world after the studies you do here. And this is with the digital world becoming more and more important uh, because you, 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 you will be confront, confronted in, in, with unsafe situations where you're not sure whether this is deep fake or whether this is um, uh, some sort of propaganda, I still use the word. Uh, and uh, uh, these sort of people who can differentiate between right and wrong in the di digital world will be very sought after. In leaders' position, but also in 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 in, in advising uh, leaders, uh, also in the business world. Uh, so I think that this is simply something uh, where the future lies for uh, educating people for international relations. I couldn't agree more with that. The DA also fulfills a public service mission through its lecture series and conferences for the general public, academics, students, and diplomats. It is a place where who you meet is just as important as what you learn. What are the main conferences and lecture series planned for 2024? Mm. Well, uh, this is, you are absolutely right that part of what the experience at the Vienna School is always this being exposed to leaders. 
uh, because we invite uh, leaders from around the globe also to give talks when they come to Vienna at the, at, at the Diplomatic Academy. Uh, and in the, in the coming months, we will concentrate a lot on, on European issues because there are many elections coming up at the moment in, in Europe. There will be elections in Poland, there will be elections now in, in, in Slovakia. Uh, very soon, uh, we uh, will have uh, uh, all sorts of, 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 of developments in the political scene, including next year, even in my own country, in Austria, we will have general elections. Uh, so we try also to, uh, to bring people uh, who are in the political decision-making of these sort of ways. Uh, because um, making decisions uh, in the domestic scene uh, is, uh, uh, is more and more dependent on the position also in international relations. Uh, there is no more differentiation between domestic policy and international relations. There is still uh, some uh, relevance uh, for political leaders to understand how important the international context is. And we try uh, to in bring, that, bring that up for them. Uh, so this will be uh, one of the major issues. Uh, and for conferences and, and meetings, uh, it is obvious that we have to respond to, re to the real world. Uh, so we concentrate on the issues of Ukraine. Uh, we will do a conference, uh, a meeting on, on, on um, uh, narratives in, in, in public diplomacy, the Russian narrative, but also the Ukrainian narrative uh, in this ongoing war. Uh, we will try uh, to, to talk about uh, what will happen after the, the, the Bretton Woods uh, ag agreements? Is there a post Bretton Woods world for the financial world? What should it look like? Uh, we concentrate on bringing here people from the rising stars uh, of the international scene. So that's certainly uh, India, but not only India. Uh, uh, and uh, we are concentrating a lot on an, an, an area which is important for Europe more and more, the Arab world. Uh, on the one hand, for political reasons, are there solutions for the Palestinian conflict? Uh, what will be the regional security structure? How will Saudi Arabia, Iran and other countries uh, uh, work here? So we, we bring in uh, leaders and experts from this Arab world uh, to Vienna. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and then we, we also develop for the coming years uh, an Africa strategy for, for our institution. Um, because we think if we are an institution in Austria and in Europe, and for Europe, the African continent must be of, 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 of prime importance uh, for many good reasons, for many good reasons. For, for the political leaders, it's mainly because of migration, fear of migration and fear that they will lose control of what's happening in Europe. Uh, for us, uh, it's certainly also we have to, we have to uh, analyze uh, how politics reacts to this, but it also needs European institutions which have a more and better contact with African institutions. So we try to work with African universities, bring African students also to this place, uh, try to help uh, set up or reform diplomatic institutions uh, in the, on the African continent. So that there is a lot of, 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 of regional work that we do in the coming two years, concentrating on, 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 the, on the areas which are of relevance for Europe, for sure, but also for, 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 for global politics. I did not mention the, the transatlantic partnership, but that's, a, that's, a, that's something that we regularly work on, because it needs that people should understand why is there this transatlantic relationship? Uh, what is the relevance of it today? Uh, how can we understand that Europe wants to be sovereign, but at the same time it has this, this, this close and historic relationship, uh, especially with the United States of America? Uh, and uh, I think this is one of the, the, the future topics we need to discuss also, because otherwise the you might call it the, the bridge between uh, across the, the, the Atlantic uh, may become a, a bit crumblier, crumblier, I would say, than it, than it is at, uh, for the time being. And as we know, there will be elections next year in the, in the United States, and uh, quite a lot depends also on, on the outcome of this. So these are some of the priorities for the next, for the next two years. Uh, and, but we will also have to look back because we always say, as, as a Vienna School of International Studies, uh, if you don't build on traditions, 
uh, you're losing out a major element of understanding what, we, what might happen in the future. Uh, next year, we will celebrate 270 years of, of, of our founding. Uh, and uh, uh, we will do this um, uh, presumably uh, in, the, in, this, uh, in the city hall of, of, of Vienna in a very glorious surrounding. Uh, and we are also combining it with something which is the basic idea of this academy. One of our most prominent alumni was a man called Josef von Hammerburgstall. Hammerburgstall is known to Austrians because he was the one who invented oriental research uh, in the German-speaking world. He was one of the first students here also at the academy and he later became uh, a diplomat with, with Metternich uh, and then he, he was the founder of the Austrian Academy of Sciences uh, quite a, some, some time later. So he's a very typical personality, how you combine international relations, diplomatic work with research work, uh, but also with the idea of how can you transmit your knowledge into a, a wider public. He has written thousands and thousands of pages in the, in the, in the early 19th century about the Orient and the, and, and the traditions and the political side of, of the Orient. Uh, and uh, we think he's a very good example of, of, of what an alumnus of the academy can do, but also what the role of an academy is. So uh, discussing this issue of, of what can we do in a country uh, in oriental research, in, in, in research in the Arab world, but also in the in overall in the Islamic world, uh, will be one of those issues which will be heavily and strongly discussed here in Vienna at the DA next year. That will also bring it it back to its roots, um, the Oriental Academy. And I think you've made a, a wonderful point of how international the DA is not only in the student set, the faculty that work there, but also in the topics and the hotspots that you deal with in your lecture series, in your classes. Um, it's really very, very unique. So if you could characterize the DA in five words, what would they be? <laughs> well, we have a logo. Educating global leaders since 1754, and that's our that's our mission. Educating global leaders since 1754. It contains the traditional part, it contains the educational part, and it, it contains that it's about leadership issues. And 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 this sort of uh, of of leadership is so much in need for, for 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 in the given situation of disruption. That why why we believe our mission is the right one. And when you say leadership, you don't only mean diplomatic leadership, because today's graduates do many things also in addition to being diplomats. Is that correct? No, absolutely. Uh, uh, less than 20% of our uh, alumni work in diplomacy. The rest works in uh, the media world. Uh, they work in uh, for, for other government institutions. They work for international organizations. And they work in business. And uh, this is still growing, the, the, the part which works in business. Uh, where, as we know now, we are living in a world where, where you might say, politics beats business. More and more business has now to understand what geopolitical developments mean for their own business. Uh, so, the field of our of interest is 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 still growing, and that's why we are proud that our uh, alumni work in so different fields of careers. I think that's what makes the DA also so very special. Is there any additional information on the DA that you would like to share with our listeners today? Uh, yes, I want to share if, if there is somebody out uh, who feels that what I said is the right thing for him or her, please apply. Uh, we have about every year now, now hopefully every year, about 1,000 applicants, graduates only, for about 120, 130 places that we have to offer here. So there is a, there, there is a fair chance. Uh, and, and if they do, there will be a, a very international surrounding. Uh, and as we all know, Vienna is the most livable city in the world in the rankings of the uh, economists, but not only economists, so it also in, in other papers. Uh, so I can only say studying and living in Vienna is not the worst thing. I can only support that. And also as a former alumni or current alumni of the DA, I can only support sending out that message to the world and hope that many, many applicants will come your way. 
Um, I know many of our listeners will be very interested to learn more about the DA, and thank you very much for this interview. And if you like what you hear, please subscribe and sign up for our newsletter, and you'll find all our articles, our interviews, and podcasts on our website at www.iglobenews.org. Ambassador Briggs, thank you very much for this wonderful interview. Thank you. Diana, it was a it was a pleasure to be interviewed by you. Uh, uh, so, and it's good to see uh, an alumni uh, uh, this way. Uh, and all the best for iGlobe News and your work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.